Ok, hai. Apa khabar warga TikTok? Ok, jom. Kali ini aku nak share satu dokumentari. Tapi disebabkan dokumentari ini panjang. So, uh, aku akan uh, adakan beberapa episod. Uh, uh, aku nak share satu dokumentari ini. Dokumentari ini berkisah berkenaan dengan cabaran masyarakat orang asli suku temuan uh, di penghujung 90-an. Uh, di uh, ni, pertengahan dan penghujung 90-an. Uh, kerana uh, kebanyakan uh, tempat uh, perkampungan orang asli semasa itu ter, Khususnya di Selangor Mengalami perubahan uh, disebabkan pembangunan yang diadakan secara berleluasa lah Pada masa itu ya, tahun 90-an uh, Selangor uh, dalam statusnya masa itu nak mengejar uh, status negeri maju uh, Banyak uh, apa ni um, projek-projek mega ya, Antaranya KLIA Uh, dan uh, antaranya juga uh, projek uh, dam ataupun empangan di Kuala Kubu Baru Empangan Pertak ya, pada ketika itu So dokumentari ini uh, menyelami uh, apa ni, um, keluahan dan juga keluhan masyarakat orang asli Yang akan uh, berhadapan dengan uh, apa ni, uh, suatu tempat kawasan perkembangan mereka yang akan dibangunkan Dan ada juga uh, masyarakat orang asli yang dah pun melalui fasa uh, pemindahan uh, kawasan kampung dan juga perubahan sosioekonomi yang menyebabkan um, mereka tidak dapat uh, survive dan juga um, apa ni kata orang mengalami perubahan lah uh, dalam kehidupan dan uh, sosioekonomi mereka. Jadi jom kita dengarkan ataupun jom kita tonton uh, dokumentari ini dalam beberapa episod aku akan pecahkan untuk uh, kita tengok um, apa ni uh, dia punya jalan cerita. Uh, nama dokumentari inilah Guardian of the forest. Uh, jadi jom kita tonton dan sama-sama korang um, hayati dan juga uh, melihat isi kandungan dokumentari tersebut. Uh, di sini uh, disclaimer bukan aku nak apa ni uh, jadikan benda ini sebagai isu ataupun nak memberi kecaman kepada mana-mana pihak pun tapi cuma nak share lah kepada generasi baru sekarang yang banyak uh, ada di dalam TikTok supaya melihat Uh, keadaan uh, kesusahan uh, dan juga masyarakat orang asli yang mula berubah sosioekonominya um, sosialnya ya uh, dan sebagainya uh, di awal-awal tahun 90-an membawa ke tahun uh, 2000 masa itu banyak perubahan yang berlaku lah jadi aku pun antara um, apa ni orang ataupun insan ataupun masyarakat orang asli yang terkesan sebenarnya uh, masa aku kecil dulu Uh, ramai yang tahu juga ataupun aku pun uh, berasal daripada sebuah kampung tradisi yang diambil tem, apa ni kawasannya dijadikan Kuala Lumpur International Airport uh, dan bila berpindah ke tempat baru kita mengalami kejutan dari segi bukan kejutan apa sebenarnya sebab um, uh, disebabkan projek KLA itu di, tergesa-gesa uh, nak dibangunkan kami berpindah dan berada di dalam satu kawasan baru yang tidak kekurangan dari segi uh, apa ni uh, dari segi kemudahan. Jom kita saksikan. She lived by a river in the Malaysian rainforest. Minah Anggun a Timuan from a little-known indigenous tribe of hunters and gatherers residing in the heart of the Malay Peninsula. She married a tribal chief who taught her the healing songs of her ancestors. Minah kept these songs alive with a passion that inspired other musicians to record them. This documentary is a tribute to a remarkable woman. Diva of the forest and cultural ambassador of the Temuan tribe. She performed at the country's biggest stadium and was introduced to millions of television viewers. But Mina's career as a rising star was short-lived. She died just two days before her group, Akar Umbi, was scheduled to begin work on their album.
with Minas' return to the spirit realms, this film took on a new urgency. In the process of documenting her story, we uncovered evidence we couldn't ignore. Evidence of a subtle but relentless policy to eradicate everything Mina believed in. Everything she had lived for. The natural way of life of Malaysia's indigenous peoples, the Orang Asli, the original guardians of the forest. Inda, Mina's younger sister, and Kung, her daughter's best friend, were both born and raised in this rainforest, which has always provided their every need. Land is sacred to the Orang Asli. It is the flesh of their ancestors, the root of their culture, their never empty larder, and their home. For Inda and Kung, the rainforest is also a workplace. Harvesting bamboo in the wild splendor of raw nature isn't easy. But Inda, like her ancestors, believes her people were placed here to enjoy the bounty of the forest. I'm much happier in the jungle. It's too hot in town and I never went to school, so I don't understand it. I understand everything about the forest, collecting this, gathering that. Working in the forest is what I understand. Inda's brother, Utat, is a simple, gentle man leading a simple, gentle life in the forest he loves. A master of the natural environment, but totally unschooled in the ways of the modern world, Utat farms and forages for the day's meal. Some days he takes the youngsters with him on his forays. They are also in search of bamboo. This time they're gathering the growing shoots, a seasonal treat. There's an art to harvesting and cooking bamboo shoots, which Utat learned from his parents and grandparents, and which he gladly passes on. Orang Asli believe the land is sacred and belongs to God. But as guardians, they belong to the land. The tribe assumes a collective responsibility to maintain the land for themselves and for posterity. Utat's greatest joy is to tend his crops, setting traps close to where he grows his tapioca and sweet potatoes, not only protects them, but could snare him a wild pig for dinner too if he's lucky. Utat spends the greater part of the day roaming around the fertile orchards he inherited from his ancestors. He looks poor, but he's actually quite wealthy. The rich bounty of the jungle is his savings bank. Planting fruit trees is how Utat invests for the future. He won't be alive when this durian seedling fruits, but he's perpetuating a cycle of growth and guardianship of food and medicinal resources handed down countless generations. A durian tree can live for more than a hundred years, and its delicious fruit provides the bulk of the Orang Asli's income. Indah and Utat's second cousin Bida is the village headman or Batin. Traditionally, the Batin is the spiritual head and arbitrator of tribal justice, a role Bida inherited from his father and grandfather before him. The Preta Orang Asli village is one that we have inherited from our ancestors. The years, I don't know how to count the years. But if you want to count the years, there are not enough numbers. When the earth was formed, we were here. Although Bidar is sure how long his people have been around, paleoanthropologists are more tentative. They say the Orang Asli came in three waves, possibly as far back as 25,000 years ago. The first and second waves came down from the north, from what is now central and southern China. The last wave began arriving about a thousand years ago, Austronesian people from the islands to the south, west and east. 
The peninsula is now populated by 18 different tribes of Orang Asli. While Bida's ancestors enjoyed a life of peace and tranquility in the rainforest, huge empires were flourishing in the region, bringing more and more traders to these shores. The first settlers were ethnic Malays, who established cordial trading relations with the Orang Asli, their suppliers of jungle products. But these Malays soon became colonizers, anchoring their culture, introducing new trade, and establishing powerful, warring sultanates. For the Orang Asli, the beginning of their slow decline. And when the Malays embraced Islam and could only keep infidels as slaves, the pagan Orang Asli went from being the hunters, gatherers and traders to being the hunted, gathered and traded. They retreated deeper into the highland forests, back into the realm of magic and myth. The Orang Asli have a spiritual view of the physical world. The mountains and the rivers, the forest and its animals, all have spirits to be respected and revered. This majestic mountain, Gunung Raja, is the center of the Tamuan universe and birthplace of the tribe. This is where the souls of the departed gather before returning to the spirit realms. The Orang Asli believe in the elven folk. They call them Orang Halus, the invisible people. Some of them possess an unearthly beauty, say the Temuan elders. We call them Langsui, sirens of the forest. They captivate you and they entice you to their home, to their dimension. They charm, tease and seduce you, till you find yourself married to them, just like that. Just like we've gone mad. Inga has an unlikely son-in-law in Antares, a writer, philosopher and musician, who moved to the forest seeking sanctuary from the stresses of city life. Antares now lives in a verdant valley just upstream of the Asli village, with his Termuan wife, Anura, and their son, Ahau. Uh, I'm not an anthropologist, so I, I didn't come here with the, with the intent to, to study them. I, I came here because, uh, well, there was a last bit of magic that I could still, uh, a tangible kind of magic that I could feel around them. Yeah. And, well, having read Tolkien, I mean, when you meet hobbits, you know, of course you're, you're, you're fascinated. You want to actually live with the hobbits for a while, right? Yeah. And how do you know that you know, they can sort of like suck you into the reality and <laughs> make you a part of the tribe, you know? Right. I'm right here, and I've had a first-hand experience of what it's like to be immersed you know, in this cultural reality where you've know, you been actually insulated from the mainstream for generations. 